Welcome to Death and Aliens, an in-depth look at horror and sci-fi TV from two cousins who vaguely know what they're doing. I'm MK. And I'm Monica. And let me tell you, it has been a week. Yeah. I, dem, dem. Um, to forget that I said that, M has definitely had the more stressful week than I have. <laughs> um, yeah. Bought a new computer. Yeah. <laughs> that uh you know it's been of course everything happened with my computer on the three most important days for our filming and producing schedule so it's been it's been a week yeah and unfortunately this episode sucked ass so like yeah it's not gonna sure. come much better no, there were there was things from a fan's point of view that were good, but storyline wise, not. And then there were things that were as a fan um, were disappointing, and but were also not, you know, meant, meant to be their story wise. So like, I, I, so okay, so I we usually record this episode on what is in Thailand Saturday night. So I watched the episode Saturday morning, we record Saturday night. So I watched the episode Saturday morning and then had some epic technology <laughs> issues Saturday night. So it is now Tuesday night. And Tuesday um, morning. But so I just literally 25 minutes ago rewatched the episode again. And I have to say, for about the first 30 minutes of the epi- no, 20 minutes of the episode, I'm with you. Like, I see where it's going. I get mm -hmm. it. And then for the next 25, actually this episode was closer to an hour long. It was, it was, so for the next 40 minutes. It's a lot of questionable things. I don't, um, I don't know what I watched. Yeah, it was. Like, it was and that's definitely. that's the problem is, I I don't know what I just watched, and it was the season finale, which yeah. means that had we watched this in 2013 when it came out, we would then be waiting a year and a half. It took a year and a half for the next season to come to Netflix. If I had to wait 18 months after watching that, I would not watch season two. I yeah. would not like. I just I would not watch it. Like full. Yeah. I have to wait three weeks, two weeks, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> if, I had to wait, if I had to wait 18 months, I literally would just move on. Yeah, and I genuinely think that um, that with everything that was done in this episode, um, not the best, obviously, um, for a finale. I really don't know where to make any conclusions or any theories that'll happen next season because instead of a finale of a season it kind of seems like how it was ended feels like a finale of a show like I, there's no, no way. I don't I don't agree at all I think it definitely set up enough it gave it gave just enough like throwing out hooks to tell you what the plot of next season what direction the plot of next season is going it's just that it was dumb like, okay. <laughs> like <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to be that aggressive about it, but yeah. In a way, it seems like they had to tie up some, they made it open enough that it, it almost looks like they ended it just in case they didn't get renewed for a second season. For like, sure. I definitely, I definitely feel like there was, uh, this could be the end if it had to be. Yeah. But there was enough, there was enough thrown out to be a cliffhanger. My issues weren't the cliffhangers. So, okay, so let me take it back. I like the first 20 minutes and the last three and a half. Yeah. yeah. It was just everything between that. That was not. It was, it was a, like, obviously where we had left off on last week's episode, you're, we're, you know, dealing with this big fight and, you know, like, holy shit. Like, you're going to actually think that something insane's going to happen from it only issue that I had with it was that it I didn't 
when the episode picked up, the rest of that scene was like maybe six minutes. But I did actually really, really like how they ended that scene. I did like how they ended it, but I was just like, this is only six minutes long. Like, what? What else is, is going to happen? Way? Yeah. Okay. So now that we've bitched, <laughs> let's get into the actual details. Um, this is Hemlock Grove, season one, episode 13. It's called Birth, which could only be led to interpretation. Yeah, but not. Mm, mm. <laughs> came out on april 19th 2013 directed by our least favorite human being darren seraphian and written by brian mcgreevy and lee shipman and let me tell you if i ever get to speak to those three men in person i have a lot of questions and Same. most of them are not kind i'm be like why did you even do this why, why? just just why. I feel like the books were good because the storyline cool. seems really good. I really feel like I now need to read the books because I, I don't. I don't think they're good. Ba based on what the major like revelation in this episode is, no, I think I would hate the books as much as I hated this episode. See, I think that. The fact that Brian McGra McGravy was pretty much the only writer on the last two episodes, and we actually really liked the last two episodes. I think... I, no, but I, I don't... I'm saying if the plot of the books matches what this episode was, and, like, okay. that's, that's what the big finale reveal of the book was, I would also hate it. Yeah, I, I would have hated that, but the thing is I don't think I would be mad at the writing. I would just be pissed. Oh no, like, I don't I don't think he's a bad writer. I think the, the actual caliber of his writing mm -hmm. is good, but it's a bad story. It's like the opposite of Stephanie Meyer. Twilight is a great story, but she writes like a four year old. Yes. His writing is good, but like what? Yeah. Like what's going on here, buddy? Um, also, yes, me and Mary Kate both love Twilight. It might be garbage, but it is our garbage. Do not come for us. It's that's okay. That's the thing. It's not garbage. The writing is atrocious. No, the writing is atrocious. I will never ever say that this woman was a good writer. But I should talk about the movies. Oh no, I I don't. The movies are garbage. The movies are so garbage. But the the actual story. And being able to come up with all of that, like, she literally just had a dream one night and then wrote it down. And, like, yeah. I'm super jealous of that because I would make so much money if I just wrote down my dreams, but also no one would read them because they're psychotic. Um, but I like that she had a different take on vampires and werewolves. That wasn't the same thing we've seen a million times over and over and over again. And in all honesty, she honestly wrote the close to real f vampire lore, not because like vampires don't necessarily, there is a whole, I watched a whole video on this literally this week. And this girl was like, you literally made them sparkle. Don't you was, dare tell me that was close to vampire lore. Because They said that their most active time, vampire pirates most active times. And she was like quoting like certain like authors that wrote books and stuff like that. She's like, we're between noon and midnight. She's like, in Hollywood vampires, we didn't see that vampires burn in the sun until Nosferatu. She's like, so you could thank Nosferatu for that. Like, she was going in and like talking about specific things that Stephanie Meyer had wrote about. She's like, it wouldn't be, far she's like, it wouldn't be extremely far fetched for vampires to sparkle. She just took an interesting take on, you know, a vampire instead of making them burn in the sun. She was like, and plus she was writing a teenage romance novel she's not gonna have her lovers burn in the sun every time they go outside she had to be okay. like mm, i have to get this but type also of that was one youtube video that you watched so mm -hmm. let's not put too much weight on that i'm gonna put all the weight on it so i can tell everyone who says that <laughs> twilight is garbage that it's not <laughs> because also their vampire lore is a lot of things because yeah lots of different cultures have different ideas of what a vampire was but in zero of them, do they sparkle? 
Yeah, they don't sparkle. She did say that. She's like, they don't sparkle. She was like, that was her take her take on it so that she could tell, like, hey, this is how they're vampires. Here's a cool, like, interesting thing about them. Like, and then she was like, and they don't have fangs because a lot of vampires in the lore, like, if they were feeding, either their fangs would drop and you wouldn't see well, them. Well, no, the fangs, the fangs being retractable or non, non, um, visible to humans is not new that's not that's not i don't have an argument on that she's like and plus the majority of um vampires did used to like drink um animal blood and normally if a uh human ate from the meat of that animal they would turn um she was like that's how most vampires would get turned back like supposedly in lore in like certain areas like that's what they believed that that's how they turned was through eating the consuming the meat that a vampire had already fed off of so i'm like that's interesting and she was like quoting all these people and like books and i'm like that sounds right <laughs> i did not see this video to fact check but that sounds completely not anything i've ever read or learned before and i <laughs> once and i once wrote a paper about the use of staccato language in Dracula to rewrite, to remake the reader feel as trapped as the characters in the book. And so I, I know what I'm talking about. That is fair. That is truly fair. Um, anyway. Back to Hemlock Grove. Sorry about our Twilight rant. It's mostly because we don't have a lot to say about this episode. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, yeah. Netflix blurb says, the tragic conclusion to the Hemlock Grove killing spree leaves both the Godfrey and romantic families devastated with the final horror yet to come. Yep. And, and, that's, we do- and that's our episode. Just kidding. I'm <laughs> that's it. Take a wild guess what you think it is. Leave it in the comments below. Um, the, there wasn't a lot of special effects in this scene. There was some like minor stuff. Um, still these same special effects artists from last week, um, it's, but only Warren Appleby and Tim Barbell, they're the only ones that were doing it, not the other special effect artists from last week, um, so I, I, uh, there wasn't really a lot of special effects, and whatever little special effects were in it, I honestly weren't bad, it was, like, tiny stuff, um, I think the only there was there was one scene that I really really liked special effects wise, and one scene that I really really hated. And technically, yeah. they were part of the same scene. Yes, and they one was um if it's the one that me and you had talked about before we had started. Yeah, that that one is more visual effects. Where I will put oh. we will put our two cents on it, but both that's of, like both of the ones I'm talking about are visual. Yeah, because well, one I might have been practical ish, but yes, I already have a whole little discussion about that because I'm gonna geek out because it reminds me of a movie. The one good thing, if I'm no, thinking okay, of- then we're actually then we're probably talking about the exact same thing. Yeah, okay, so it starts with a scene of a flashback to six months earlier where Christina and Peter were hanging out, just like talking and. Peter was like, listen, like, you've got so much going for you in your life. Like, you're going to get out of this town and you're going to be such a great person. And like, if I weren't me, I'd be so jealous of you. And it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was one of those scenes that isn't really necessary, but kind of like gave us a goodbye to a character. Mm -hmm. The only problem is we didn't care about that character. So neither of us really had any feelings about this scene. Um, she was sus right from the right, right from the get go. I was like, no, I don't like her. I was like, I, I oh, did. Christina and Peter were like real friends, which is weird because I'm like, why didn't you show that in the actual I don't know show so that we could maybe I don't know not hate her for spreading rumors that he's a wolf and people believing it. Like, why didn't we get to see that they they had a friendship? So then the credits happen. Yeah, that was that much information before. Fantastic. Um, then, post credits, we go straight back to where we were before. Sorry, I'm having issues with my computer stand. Um, where uh, Lisa was banging on the door to yes, get out. Yes, Lisa's like banging on the door trying to get out of the church, church and it's locked. And the uh, wolf is coming for Monsieur Roman. And then uh, the wolf, like, 
attacks him and knocks his uh, axe and axe. jigger thingy out of his hand and he's like pretty much screwed. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, and then as he's about to be like dead, Peter appears as a wolf. And I wrote, Peter saves Roman's ass. And then Christina Wolf bit Peter Wolf's neck. And I wrote, or not. <laughs> yeah. I when that happened, I'm like, okay. What in the ever-loving shit just happened? You can't. Like, in my head, like, I'm knowing, like, okay, like, Peter's not gonna die. But I'm like, how are they bringing his ass back? Like, how are they gonna be, like... And so then, Peter's, like, dying. And Roman and Letha are not, not very far off. When suddenly, Shelly runs in, picks up Christina, and just snaps Snap. her neck. She literally went squeeze and <laughs> she was gone <laughs> like that's what you get for killing her best friend bro exactly um it was very intense and um roman was in shock and i have one comment before we get to what immediately happens next when this happens and christina drops on the ground they show christina as a person again and then they show that Peter is still a wolf. So I was like, not dead. He's not dead. Yeah. If he was, he would have gone back to being Peter too. Like, right? Mm -hmm. Question mark. So either he wasn't dead or they suck at telling a story. Yeah. I'd like to think both are true. Yes. As um, that we can see from other areas of this episode alone. So then... Surprise, Sheriff Sworn is hanging out up in the, the church choir area of the, the church, and he just shoots Shelly the F up. And here's the thing that I have to say about this scene. I was thoroughly pissed because I'm like, if the, he was up there to see everything that just happened, why the fuck is he shooting Shelly? One. Two, if... um. The only, but the good thing about it, I will say the acting, because we don't get to see Shelly get shot. We just see, hear a sound and blood show up on Roman's face. And Roman looks like how someone should look, or I would assume would look. If someone, like your sister got shot right in front of you, he was like, he didn't know what to say. And like, he, had, it was just like one of those scenes where I was like, oh damn, like this yeah, is something. Yeah, no, that he, so Bill Skarsgård and Penelope Mitchell both acted that f out of that scene like roman mm -hmm. and letha both like that was really great they did a really solid job there um i can only assume that tom did not see everything that's but the thing that i said well maybe you're right because if based could, on based on his can the things he continues to say throughout the episode there's no way he saw everything then they probably should have specified that because in that moment, it for me watching it, it felt like he had saw everything and he waited until Christina was dead and then shot her. Like, or like the wolf was dead. Like, that's how it looked to me. But, um, I mean, he, maybe. He's, but if you probably right, though, he's like, either completely right. in denial or he didn't see everything. Like, those are the only two options. I mean, um, Got pissed at Top Torrid, not gonna lie. I was like, you mother... Like, you um, asshole. So then, Shelly runs away after she was shot, and Roman chases after her, and uh, Roman tells Tom to leave her alone. And then we go back into the church and Letha's crying and like cuddling with the wolf Peter as he's whimpering to death. And then suddenly he just comes back to life and everything's fine and he has a face again. Yeah. Like he went to sleep. Like she, Letha went to sleep and she like woke up and like Peter's just like, mm, 
grunting and he has a face which that really confused me but then i was sitting there thinking i'm like well he had to give up his human face i think once because for christina to change on a moon like that's something that's not on a moon she had to probably give up something as well and she looked completely normal no but she she's different she's a psychopath um no but i will say this skips a scene but it's fine because I don't really care about going completely in order this episode because nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But so Peter's awake and Letha brings him to his mom and Destiny. And Letha's talking to Linda about what happened. And Destiny, like, Letha's like, I don't understand how something like that can happen. And Destiny just goes, neither do I. And I go, my note literally says, if Destiny is confused, imagine how I feel right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then when she was talking to Peter's mother in the scene, like, she was like, I, he was, like, dead one second and alive the next. She's like, I don't know how, like, he could have came back. And she's like, it's love. And I'm like, oh, we're gonna cop out with this bullshit. Right. She's oh. like, you did it. Life is the most powerful magic there is, and life is love. And I was like, what? None of this makes sense. What hippie bullshit but, are you But then also, after that, Peter has weird magic powers for the rest of the episode. So, like, yeah like mr voodoo man so unless so maybe maybe it really was some i just this episode makes no sense sense. does not make sense so zero the only the only thing we skipped was um roman telling his mom what happened and crying over shelly and it was very Sad. emotionally yeah it was not very important but just it was yeah. just something to like hit home the fact that like oh shit shelly uh she dipped like, <laughs> like yeah so then norman picks letha up from destinies and the news is calling shelly the killer um and norman they have this like scene where they're going back and forth between the two conversations and Norman is telling Letha and Olivia is telling Roman um, about like the cover up plan that Norman and Olivia have arranged and how none of the kids were there and Shelly did this by herself and it's all sad, but it's all done now and it blah, blah, blah. And Letha says the line, we are Godfrey's and what we say happened, happened. Yeah. And it was kind of upsetting To see them, like, so willingly, like, without any remorse, like, let Shelly take the fall for all of this. But, like, it doesn't surprise me based on their characters. No, but... Done and over with, and to keep Rome, not Roman, um, Peter out of, like, getting accused, and it still keep happening. Well, Letha, Letha did it for Peter. Yeah. Roman is doing it because he doesn't want to fight. He doesn't have any fight left in him, to be honest, because... But I also think that as callous as it might seem, Olivia is right about one thing. She says, um, this is what Shelly would have wanted. Like Shelly's only hope would have been to not cause you guys any more pain. Mm -hmm. Which is so true. Yeah. Um, And I think Roman knows that. But Roman also right now, the only thing he cares about is finding Shelly. He fully yeah. believes he fully believes she's not dead and she's out there and he has to be the one to find her. And, I have a feeling it's gonna be season two is gonna have a little side quest of him like searching for his sister. I have thoughts on that, but we'll get there. Um, but Olivia says if no, Olivia says when Shelly returns, we'll protect her. Just that's what we do. Family takes mm-hmm. care of its own. Like we will. We got this. Olivia says a lot of things about family in this episode. And it makes me hate her so much. Me too. Me too. So then we have Christina's funeral. And um, Letha and Norman are there. And Norman's like, uh you didn't have to come and she was like no but like we have to keep up appearances we're godfrey's and they have a cute little moment and um 
I found it really funny. Uh, Letha said, everything has its season. And uh, Norman said, Ecclesiastes. And Letha goes, the birds. Which it's because, so for everything in life, there is a season is a verse in Ecclesiastes 3 in the Bible. Um, but it's also the main lyric to a song called Turn, Turn, Turn by the birds. <laughs> but it was just funny that his mind immediately went to the Bible and hers went to like a 70s rock band. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess I kind of love. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then Norman goes to talk to Tom. And it's when we find out that Tom really fully believes Shelly killed everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and that she's a monster and that he thinks that it's not over and uh he retired turned in his badge quit his job and um was wants... like set out to like bring down the whole God yeah family he's like he's like if i was really a, he's like everybody's calling me a hero but if i was really a hero i would burn down the godfrey tower with price still inside um and like saying all this like crazy like timothy mcveigh stuff yeah and i i think it's um i i think he's more so after price which honestly makes no sense oh no it makes perfect sense like okay i I shouldn't say make, make no sense but i feel like he would also have some resentment against not norman but olivia as well as Bryce. But he, I think everyone in this town kind of knows that Shelly was dead and then Price did something and now she's not. And they think of her as an abomination or a monster, which means Price made the monster. Very true. It's like, we're literally, this turned into Dr. Frankenstein. No, it, dude, we said that since day one. Episode sure. one, we talked about how it was Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. Except for in, in the book, people are mad at Frankenstein. And at least Tom has the sense to know that you got to take down the doc, or the, everyone in the book was mad at Frankenstein's monster, but Tom has the sense to know you take down the doctor if you want the monster I gone. Marcus, yeah. Yeah. Um, then we have a scene at the tower where Norman is signing over his rights to Laud. And my only note for that whole scene is, fuck the bishop. Wow, that's a sentence I never thought I'd ever hear you say. (laughs) Um, But then also, I have another note later that also just says, fuck the bishop. I really just hate this man. I hate him so much. I've But so basically, this horrible man has taken over most of the shares of the company. And uh, he says something about the head that wearing is wearing the crown. Or no, he says to peace in the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And uh, Price says, well, you'll have to share that crown with Roman Godfrey. Because uh, as we learned a few episodes ago, once Roman turns 18, everything is his. Mm-hmm. And um, he is just about to turn 18. His 18th birthday is in this episode, so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, yes. So then we go back to Oh, I, there's a whole scene I wrote zero notes about. Um, we're at Letha's house, and there's some dumb interaction between her and Peter, and he's telling her he likes her ass being fat from being pregnant, and it's stupid, and I hated it. Um, like, don't lose that backyard baby weight. Oh, my God, it was disgusting. It was like... like- Peter, but like honestly, as disgusting as it was, it honestly made me like kind of happy because I'm like they're like acting like a normal couple and not weirdos. Like, 
like they're asking yeah. like, okay. he was like he was like what are you gonna tell the baby about all of this and she just goes eh. and he was like is that what it feels like to talk to me and she was like yeah mm-hmm. it was it was cute but um they were t- talking about taking Roman to Destiny to try to find Shelly because they were running out of options. So they go, then we go to Destiny's and she is trying to help him, like Roman, but she says she can't hear anything. There's no, like, Shelly's not responding. She's not picking up anything on the crystals. And Roman's like, no, but she has to be out there. And she needs me. And Destiny is like, are you sure she's the one who needs you? And it's the first time that, like, we see Roman even attempt to deal with the fact that as much of his life has been about protecting Shelly, he can't function without her. Yeah. And I I think that's pretty prevalent because I feel like a part of him is also guilty because I think he's starting to understand that all the times that he should have been there for her when like he wasn't type of deal but like he still always did try to be there for her but to know that like she like he knows that that's her biggest thing is like him being there for her yeah and the fact that he literally can't be because she ran off yeah it's probably Um, eating away and um I'm sorry I will tell you that right now is where I start to hate everything about the episode yes for sure because the next moment we get the first glimpse of peter's weird voodoo magic that he has never had before because he's Mm -hmm. sitting there waiting for destiny and roman to be done talking and all of a sudden the book that he's reading just magically flips to a page that is a picture of an angel and then he takes his phone out because he knows letha's about to call him and say she's having the baby Mm -hmm. See, when I watched it, I didn't know if it was people had weird voodoo magic. I don't, I don't know if it was that or if it's like a sign that like they have like a third, like a six, not third, a sixth sense intuition as being a wolf. So like they'll get signs from like their spirits or whatever saying like, hey, this is yeah, happening. But he's never, sho- they've never shown it before in the show. If that was a thing and that was part of his wolf power and he had like some like animism powers, I would be totally down with it if they had shown it any time before the 13th episode. True. That's like, true. it's like he died, he came back to life, and now he suddenly has, like, spirit powers. I'm like, the fuck? Powers. Because there's three moments that things happen that should not, that did not make sense. Like, that should not, he should not have been able to do. This yeah. is the first, this is the first of the three. Um... Then we have what is kind of a cute scene. Actually, I really liked it. Um, Roman comes out. Peter checks on Roman. Roman's kind of not okay. and But Roman can tell Peter like has something to say. And he's like, what is it? He's like, it's birthday. And then they get excited. Like, and, and they get excited and they hug. And Destiny's like, ooh, babies. I love babies. And it's a cute like family moment. And then they go. Ah, uh, she. <laughs> but also... In light of what's about to happen, I have to say, Letha and Peter's phone call, horrible. Yeah. Yeah. He he says, have a baby. No, but he says all this ridiculous stuff about how, like, he loves the shit out of her and anything that pops out of her and, like, so much. And she goes, catch you on the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Spoiler alert, but not really, because we're going to talk about it right now. Um, that's the last thing she will ever say to him. Catch you on the fucking flip side. No, nah, I love you. Uh, I can't wait to see you. Oh, I'm going to have this baby. I love you so much. I'm being cute back. Just catch you on the flippity flip. Click. Like, the what? <laughs> so anyway, we all are now at the Godfrey Institute, and the boys are... Um, smoking cigars and getting excited about being dad slash uncle slash dad mm. um, mm, uh, mm. anyway um, and they're smoking cigars and they're being all excited 
and um, oh, I forgot the important thing that Destiny says to Roman before they leave. She says, to be the still point in the turning world is a warrior's greatest feat. Which I wrote a note at that moment that I thought, my thought was, don't go looking for Shelly. She'll find you. Be the still point. Mm -hmm. Don't know if that's correct based on what things that happen later, but that was my thought. But so then boys are smoking cigars. They're talking about what's going on. Um, they're excited to have a baby. Uh, and Roman tells Peter that the reason he knows Shelly's still alive is because he's been doing his little uh, roofy eyes in the mirror to himself and like saying like see her and he says that he can but it's just a light and she's an angel and then and, uh, what it was it was just like that honestly that scene was up until well, no. a certain point. No, the... well, so then, but so he says things about these angels, but he tells Peter that in when he does this, Shelly keeps saying to him, you have to make your heart steal. And then Peter has a flashback to something Destiny told him about Roman. And Roman's like, what do you think it means? But Peter doesn't want to get all serious on him. And he's like, You make yourself cluck like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Which I I like how I I like their heavy yet trying to keep it light areas between Roman and Peter a yeah. lot. Like those like the like th this scene like their interaction is the only good thing about possibly the rest of this scene is their interactions. Um, just. I don't, they don't even really have that many more interactions. Exactly. Which goes to show um, how shit the scene is. Yeah, no, basically, uh, the rest of this episode is crap. Uh, so then, Lisa's screaming. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, Peter jumps up and has his weird voodoo magic that we didn't know he had again. And uh turns out Lisa's dead. Yeah. She uh during childbirth, like this is the only thing I'm going to point out. Me and Em had briefly discussed this. Um the, the one day that we were supposed to film, but her laptop took a shit. Um Price is currently washing his hands when a nurse comes out saying, like, we need you in here now. And he has this, like, sense of knowing of what's about to happen on his face. Like, it looks like he was, like, like, he didn't want to do it. More like, he had to do it. Is I, my guess. Or he knew he had to do something. I have a feeling that it's not what you think it is based on something that will happen later. So yes, Price is washing his hands and he goes into the room and he has this weird like look on his face that's very uncomfortable and there's this weird there's this weird vibe to him and yes, I think he has to knows he has to do something, but I genuinely don't think it's what you're thinking it is because of something that happens later. If it's if it's a one scene that I I have a feeling that you're you're talking about, I think that's why it happens is because he because there's someone in the background making certain things happen. There's a reason why Letha had to go there, and yes, that well, no, but I will explain my thought when we get to the scene that I'm talking about because it's not it's something that I didn't pick up. It's the one thing that I didn't pick up till the second time I watched the episode. Okay. So, um, 
But yeah, so Letha is dead. Everyone is not reacting very well, um, particularly Norman. Um, and Norman is demanding that Price bring her back to life. Um, and Price says that he can't because she's too old. But, oh, I apologize. Uh, but he could probably bring the baby back. And uh, Norman's like, fuck the baby. I don't want the baby. I want my baby. It was all very sad. Um, yeah. And um, I don't even know necessarily the order of the next scenes because I have such sporadic notes because I just, I didn't have much to say. Um, but based on my notes, the next thing that happens is that uh, Peter is at home having a, a breakdown and his mom is like, listen, you're going to have a really long, full life, which means you're going to have pain and you loved her and she loved you and it was beautiful and now it sucks and now it hurts, but those are all good things. Like it's okay to feel this. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the bathroom and starts cutting his hair, which I did not understand. Me neither. I now understand it after the end of the episode, yeah. but at the moment, I did not understand. Yeah, it's just like, so he's having a mid-breakdown, he's just like, <laughs> um, I did what half my friends did in quarantine, which is shave their head. I mean, I shaved my head in a parking lot one time in the dark, so like, I can't even. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, yeah, when I had the half of my head shaved, Trevor I and I did it. Parking lot. Yeah, Trevor and I shaved my head in the Niagara Falls High School parking lot after the final night of Fiddler. What a time, honestly. You know, I wish I would do that, but instead of, you know, getting to shave my head after a musical, I was just called a hooker because that's literally the role I played in Hairspray. I was hooker number one. I was the number one hooker, though. I was a hooker in Hairspray, too. Look at that. It runs in the family. <laughs> um, but then we have Price at his desk. And he is crying and he is losing it. And then he freaks out and punches his desk and shatters the glass everywhere. So clearly he is very unhappy with whatever he had to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the th scene I thought still, you were No, still not what I'm talking about. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, then Roman is sitting alone in the freaking attic just crying because he has lost Shelly and Letha all in like a day. And his mom comes upstairs and is like, what do you need? And he's like, Peter. But he's in love with Peter. So then she Which takes him. It's only she, just takes him, she takes him to Peter's and they find out that Peter and his mom have skipped town and Roman breaks down. But here's the problem. This is also when Olivia decides to reveal everything about her. Everything about her. All the questions that we had of like, who is she? What is she? And she goes into like saying like a fairy tale, like a bedtime story of this little girl. And like, she's the fairest in the land and she ran off with the stable. No, and but that's the thing is she wasn't the fairest in the land. She was the plainer of two sisters. She was the ugly sister. So she decided to go run away with the slave because she was ugly. And then the slave stole all her stuff. So she tried to kill herself. But here's the thing. That bitch had a tail and she cut it off. I literally wrote, uh, okay, these are my notes. These are my notes. What was on Olivia's back? Told you she's a million years old. And then the next one says, maybe Peter is descended from Magdalena. Because that one. Uh, she has stole this slave boy and then she had his baby. And then she said, the blood of a slave is still a slave. Get rid of him. They called the baby Magdalena, 
apparently that's why she hates gypsies. And um, my only thought is that it would make the blood feud make more sense if it was. The but same. how would she know that Magdalena had or became either a I romantic? Don't, how does she know anything she knows? That's fair. <laughs> That's a fair reason to say, but she was just being her weird cryptic ass self again. But, it's, but it's also, story about it, saying she was always going to be there for her Roman. I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> <She knew this. laughs> also, actually, at this point, we don't know that she tried to kill herself. Yeah, at this point, we don't because, like, the story goes back and. Forward. Yeah, she goes back into the bedtime story later. But at this point, we just know that she had a baby with a slave and then got rid of it. Yeah. Um, and then, because they were going to give it to her older sister, and that's when she said the blood of a slave should be treated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slave. Then, um, Norman leaves Marie because, you know, he has no reason to still be with her now that Leith is a dad. Which is kind of shit because we don't know how long after Letha's death that he was just like, I'm out. Deuces, I'm going to be with Olivia. It's probably the same day. That's rough. Feel, feel bad for Marie. That's tough. Oh, no, I, I, I definitely do. But also, like, he's not coping. No. Um, which we know he's not coping by the next scene that is family dinner at the Godfrey's where Olivia's like, let's get more wine, trying to have a normal conversation. And Norman and Roman are both sitting at the table, practically comatose, just like... Sitting there, like, staring either at each other or at the plate in front of them, just sitting there. And they're not talking. And then she rings the bell. She's like, yes, I think we shall. And she, like, rings the bell. She's like, like, I'm gonna need more wine to get through this. Yeah. So then she goes and uh, roofy eyes Norman to make him go to bed. Mm -hmm. And then goes to uh give roman his 18th birthday present and mind you roman's like having his own cool ass party in like the empty pool listening to some banging and by cool ass party i'm she means he's smoking a cigarette drowning his sorrows wishing he was dead and that the pool was full but at least the music's bopping yeah the music's bopping and then, <laughs> and then Olivia comes in with the little sparkler, like, "Happy hey. birthday, Mr. President!" And I'm like, Olivia, like, so why? Just lay down, go to bed. No one asked. Um, and she takes him up to the to attic. The attic. I hate this scene, but I, I also it. love it at the same time. I There's hate other. Every- I hate everything about everything that I'm going to say from the next 10 minutes. So she brings him up there and there is a like crinoline, like draped crib with candles all around it and everything's black and it looks like. But the sacrifice. Yeah. Like, no, it looks like straight up like the, where the demon baby rises in a horror movie. Like it's awful. Like Rosemary maybe by Ro- did I say that right? No, Rosemary. you should sure not. I said Rosemary's maybe, but Rosemary's baby vibes are definitely happening in that room at the present moment. And um, Roman's like, what in the ever-loving F is this? And she's like, remember. And then we get a series, of, a series of flashbacks, both his and hers, that um, are horrible, where we learn um, that, we, this is where we learn that Olivia did try to kill herself, um, but she came back to life. Also, uh, Roman uh, raped Letha and then made her forget, just like he did to Ashley. And uh, he is the father of the baby. Um, but here's the thing. He obviously also forgot, too, because Olivia had sent Roman pretty much to do it. Yeah. Oh, like, no. Olivia, you're going to go rape your cousin. Cool? Cool. I don't know if she did, though. 
I think she did. If she ha- she says like, she has this whole elaborate thing set up. She damn well knows what the hell she did. She's no, no, like, no. Oh. She knows what happened, but I don't know if she fully like made him do it or just knows what I happened. Think, I think she did because Peter, not Peter, Roman does has zero recollection of doing that. Like he's self he's self aware of what he did to Jenny, not Jenny. Um. Ashley. No, but he also was struggling a lot with his powers and everything before, basically everything that happened before Peter got there and he started to understand himself is a question mark. That's fair. So I don't know. I do, I mean, I think it's possible that Olivia is behind it, but I, I don't know that's that's fair i'm my i'm still going with olivia because that's Um, how the rest of the scene makes it look as well but um in this particular moment they uh superimposed roman's face onto the image of the angel that we had already seen in letha's memory and it has got to be the shittiest cgi i have ever seen for sure. Like, how hard would it have been? Like, this is the one thing where it's like, why bother CGIing something like that when you can easily do that practically? Like, I get maybe the wings might be a hard thing to make pop up in the middle of that. So, like, CGI that. But, like, still, you can backlight someone and, like, but, put a spotlight. But on also, face. forget, I mean, I agree, but also forget practical effects. These people are capable of making a wolf's snout come out of somebody's mouth and they can't put a face on a black figure? Yeah, that's also true. Like, they also had Peter's jaw jingle jangling on the floor and they couldn't put his face. And that's, a, and that's the only sad thing. Like, we are not going to diss the visual effects. Like, they've done great this whole season and that's the thing. You do great all season. One bad effect is going but to it's make like, it. But it's like, it's one really of those things where it's so bad that it's probably the thing I remember the most from the episode. Yeah. Um, and um, so we also learn in this scene and this is something I did not catch the first time. Olivia is explaining to Roman that like what happened when he was born in the call and she ate the placenta and she like how they're connected and what they are and blah, blah, blah. And she said that she would, she had a ton of kids. Juliet was just the first. She had a ton of kids that were born without the mark. And in that scene, it's very slight, but you watch her and you hear it and she snapped Juliet's neck. Oh yeah. She said, screw my kid. So here's the thing, basically what Price's job was, was to find out if the baby was born with the mark or not and get it to Olivia if it was. Letho was collateral damage. That, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. I don't think that he was going after to specifically kill Letha. I just think that he knew. If the, I think if the baby happen. had been born without the mark, Letha and the baby both would have been fine and everyone would have moved on with their lives. Mm-hmm. But because it was, they, they had to, he had to take it. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's with the, if she has the call because. Oh no. Was, oh, oh no, she did. Well, here's the thing. If that's the case, Literally, Olivia's waiting for Nor at a certain point. Olivia's waiting for Roman to do something to that baby. Yeah, she wants him to do the same thing she did so that she he can bond with the baby. She said, You know what you have to do. And she like showed that there was blood on her finger. She is trying to get him to do the same thing to the baby that she did to Roman so that it, they can bond. Okay, see, I thought he was going to have her. The baby. No. That's how it looked. And I'm like, the fuck? Um, so, yeah. Um, so then, 
I wrote, fuck Olivia, what the hell is this? Then um, she keeps telling him he knows what he has to do. And she's like saying all this stuff. And um, then he like looks in the mirror and like compels himself to make his heart steal. And she's like, oh, you're such a clever boy. And then he's like, I'm a warrior, you won't win. And he straight up kills himself. Like, he literally, and like, like he did it. The, it was so intense. Yeah, like that was so, really. It was graphic. And I think he Mary slits his wrists, but he like basically slits from like his wrist all the way to his elbow, just one straight deep ass line on both arms, and it was like audible like it was graphic and like the amount of blood that and the thing is they're not overusing blood either or underusing it like if you like you're opening arteries like yeah no and and this show has been very good about when and how they use blood and it Mm -hmm. was proper intense and this is one of the things i think that me and mary kate me and you, I think, are both like, this is like the cool visual effect thing. A- I, am I, right? I just, I didn't write anything at first. And then I wrote, wait, is his blood moving upwards? Because I thought it was just showing blood dripping. And then I was looking at it again and I was like, oh, no, no. His blood is crawling up the wall. And that's where I was like, because there was one part of it where it's doing this thing where it's going up the wall, but it's at an angle. And it re- reminded me of the one scene from an Nightmare on Elm Street. If anyone has seen it, it's Don, Johnny Depp's death scene where his blood gets sprayed upwards, but they did it all practically upside down. Do well, I think they? I, I that this I could tell from the way it was dripping that, like, and the speed at which it was dripping. Well, I think what they did was they filmed it upside down and then sped up the film mm-hmm. so that it was moving a little quicker than it would actually fall. Yeah, and. Uh, Obviously, I don't think it was as elaborate to the point where they were gluing the whole set to the ceiling and just shot it upside down. But I, because it, it wasn't like a huge part. It was, it was just like a close up of the wall. Yeah, it was just like, a close up of the wall. So they just would have had to um, make sure that they had the um, the crown molding, ring. the crown molding in the right direction. Yeah. Um, and um, they they did a really good job with that. And then. Um, oh God. We don't see where his blood's going until later, but um, Olivia starts singing to Roman in a nice, weird foreign language again from her ancient times of being the ugly sister. And Roman, yeah, you know what language it is? The same language that Peter and his mother speak. It was Romani. Well, would you look at that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then. I wrote, oh, killing himself is ma- makes him fully one, question mark? Yeah, because Roman takes a nice deep breath after Olivia sings him this lullaby thing. And, and he like, this is it, where we actually get the flashback of her waking up. And when in her flashback, she has vampire fangs. Yeah, she got like, hmm. He does not. Yeah, well, he does, but he doesn't. He does. At one scene, he has. Well, yes, yes, yes. But I mean, okay, yes, but when he wakes up, he doesn't suddenly have fangs. Oh, yeah, no, he's not like damn pretty yeah. teeth like he was. And yeah. uh, so he gets up, and she's pretty much saying, at this point, I think we realized that it wasn't, she wasn't supposed to be saying, like, keep your heart steel. It was to keep your no, heart. No, 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 not yet, not yet. Oh, yeah, that's, that's way later. Forget that I said that. Yeah, that's what, but so he wakes up. And Olivia's like, oh, my boy, like, this is what we are, like, blah, 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 being all her weirdness. And then she's, like, uh, trying to, like, love on him. And, and he's then, getting slightly erotic also at this point as well, I'm pretty sure. Because he's doing then, a lot of like, this stuff with his fingers and blood. Yeah, and then he just... Uh, goes and full on vamp fangs and bites the fuck out of Olivia's neck and drains her. While she's moaning. 
Yeah, she's real into it. She is real, real into it. And then he starts to kiss her. And I wrote, it's a big no from me, dog. But, yeah. but what he was really doing was as he kisses her, he bites her whole ass tongue, rips it from the root out of her mouth, spits it across the room and says, you talk you too talk. much. And I was like, this man really just said, and then my next note, it says, it's a big no for me. And the next note says, what on earth? He's been thinking, he just did what all the rest of us have wanted to do since the first episode. Because she never shuts up about her being, oh, like, I don't care. And as that. he walks away from her, we see silhouetted around him that his blood that moved up the walls has formed made angel-, angel wings on the wall. And then he walks downstairs in his newfound power and you hear a background voice saying, you must make your heart still, not steal. Yeah. So uh, he's fully a vampire now. Yeah. But here's my question. Mm-hmm. If Olivia became a vampire when she was 13, how does she look like she does now? I have no idea. Unless- anyway, the episode is not done yet. Um, we have another scene where um, it's just a series. Okay, so basically that's the end of the season. And then everything else that happens from here on out is all the cliffhangers that they threw in for season two. Basically, mm-hmm. if they didn't know they were going to get a season two, it would have ended with Peter with Roman walking down the stairs, mm-hmm. really. And then we have about five or six minutes of just all the shit they want us to think about for next season. Mm-hmm. The first scene is Michael Chasser going to meet with the bishop, who I think has more connections to Olivia than we would like to realize because his servant called him your grace that made me uncomfortable yeah um but basically he tells michael that roman godfrey murdered his sister not michael should go after him then we get another scene where tom is chilling in his basement making bombs mary kate yeah unless this is in your little recap i don't think it is i think it happened prior peter and linda in the car no 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 that's the next scene after the bombs okay all right just making sure oh nope it's not there's one more scene and then peter and his mom okay so this is the order because there's five five exit scenes one is Michael and the bishop. Two is Tom making bombs. Tom three, making bombs. Tom making bombs. Scene three, Price is looking over Olivia's corpse and says, well, I think we could find room in here. And she's like, I wrote, oh, Roman killed his mom for like real. Oh, okay. <laughs> Next, scene number four, which I thought should have been the last scene. Uh-huh was Peter and his mom driving in the car, just escaping the town. And then Peter sees Shelly on the side of the road and for the third time in an episode has some voodoo magic powers that he shouldn't be able to have. And he sees Shelly as dream Shelly. Mm-hmm. And he like smiles cause he's like, he knows that she's like still alive and like she's and okay. okay. Yeah. Which I was like, oh. And then it goes to black, and I was like, oh, that's such a nice way to end it. Only then they didn't end it like that. And they have another scene of Project Ouroboros. And we finally get to see what is inside that little thing. And fun fact, it's a baby in a weird-ass cocoon. And then take first breath and opening its eyes. It opens its eyes, and the episode is over. Yeah. So Cocoon Baby is what Roman saw 
all those episodes back that Price was like, <sighs> see, I thought it would have been more crazy. Like, that's yeah. also crazy. But I, I mean, it's, to- it's messed up, but like, Price literally brought his sister back to life as like a Frankenstein monster. Why would a baby yeah. be that weird to him? Like, it just doesn't seem exactly. right. Um, doesn't seem right. But also, my final note for the episode says, literally, I have no words. That's how I felt a majority of the episode. I, looking back at it, I kind of concerned as to how the hell we're gonna, like, I, we obviously know that there's gonna be some stuff with Michael coming into the picture. Now, the Shastor family has not given up on Hemlock Grove. Especially now that Lod's involved. And I feel like Lod knows more than they, I think that we think mm. we know. Oh, which reminds me of something that I thought. It's a speculation. Because I... Okay, so as I was watching it, the, I had the realization that the actor who played Olivia's dad in the flashbacks reminded me of someone. I couldn't figure out who. And then I realized that it, he reminded me of the Nazi Upir from Nick's flashback. So I looked it up and they are not the same actor, but they do look very, very similar. So it may still be connected. Possibly. (coughs) But I also think that he's connected to the bishop somehow. Oh, I see, I don't know. I think the bishop is this outside thing that just knows a little bit too much from somewhere else. Don't. I think he's part of. Because if she, because she literally said, "Well, we have to let Lod know who they're dealing with," and like killed Chessor. <laughs> like Chessor went missing because she gave them my from. Yeah. It feels like I feel like they're both aware of what each other's agendas are, and they're right. like, "Don't fuck with us." Both of them were like, "Don't fuck with us." Right, which is why he told Michael to go after Roman, not Olivia. Yeah. But also, Olivia's dead. She ha- I, Olivia has to come back. There's I mean, no way she's actually dead. I don't really take anyone in the show being dead as, as permanent. A, yeah. The only one I think is permanent is Letha. Oh my god, I know. Um, so. But uh, we won't get too much into our thoughts on season two yet because next week We are doing our season one recap episode where we'll be talking about like favorite episodes, least favorite episodes, um, stuff like that. We will be watching the season two trailer and kind of forming some more theories based on that. We will also be having our very first guest on the podcast, Miss Courtney Elaine Cloud, our number one fan, will be joining us for that um and yeah so uh who it was quite, quite like to punch. who do i want to punch um the director and the writer <laughs> 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 that's who i want to punch uh no, just kidding just kidding um this, there's so many like, people i'm like i want to there, I feel like so many people were so indifferent. Like, there was no, not one character that was just, like, blatantly mad at the whole episode or, like, blatantly oh. happy with the whole episode. Mine, mine is easy. It's the bishop. Because literally every note about him just says, fuck this guy. Well, yeah. You know, I'll go with you on the bishop for that. Because that's fair. I just didn't see him as a big, he was, like, he more of a new. Yeah. He wasn't a very big character in the, sh- in the episode. But every time I saw him, I just got irrationally angry. Um, saving grace is freaking Roman for double munching on Olivia's neck for saying screw you, biatch, for just being like funny and like kind of like his self discovery path that he had this episode. Like his story, I think, was probably the most coherent thing out of the whole episode. It was annoying, yes, but I think his him getting to where he had to go to do as confusing as it was, we finally got to we got answers about his character that we had been questioning like is he a real vampire is he not a real vampire why is he doing this and we finally like understood 
everything that he was going through, almost everything that he was going through this season in this episode. And was it done I can fantastic? respect that choice. Um, I have no one. Absolutely no, no one. That's fair. Because I hated this episode so much. That like every character, every character that even had a good moment, then also didn't. Like the moment where Roman is sitting on the floor crying and just wants Peter. Like I was like, oh, Roman's gonna be my saving grace. And then he went and bit his mother's tongue out and turned out to be his creepy half sister's baby daddy. Like so. Yeah, no. and the only thing that I see, I didn't care that he ripped his mother's tongue out because you it know just- I would. No, it was just the fact that he kissed her to do it. Mm, sorry. Yeah. He, 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 has, he has now had a child with his half-sister and made out with his mother. Yeah, the incest in the show is real spicy. Um, but here's the thing. The thing with Ashley was a completely different story. I am mad at that. Yes, I am still mad that what happened with Lisa, Letha happened. I just don't think it was him. I don't think that he was the one. Which is, which is fair. I'm, I'm not saying I'm mad at him about the, the act. I'm just mad at the whole revelation. Wait. I think I know. I, I, I know. Here's, I, I just had a problem, like a theory in my head. You know how when Olivia, Olivia had carried a child while she was a vampire. I think like there has to do some weird like voodoo not voodoo but like weird like sense of knowing of when you turn into a vampire it has to do with something with the child because i think olivia was planning on turning him into a vampire that night because i think she could tell that roman was at his wits end of wanting to be alive like because he just lost his cousin he just lost well, his son. yeah but i see i think she has had something there i think she's known that this, I don't think she planned for Luther to die. Well, I also don't think that being a vampire in this show is the same thing as being a vampire in other shows because she had like 15 babies. She just yeah. happened to murder eight of them. Yeah. Like, so, like, she's a vampire, but she's still popping out babies. Like, and also, she turned when she was 13 and is now a full grown woman. So, it's clearly not the same thing. Aging is possible. Unless. Unless it's because she's part gypsy. No, but wolf. she's, I don't think that's, she's well, part, not part gypsy, but part wolf. She has a tail. So she may not be able to. I don't know what that tail was. Peter doesn't have a tail. No, but I don't know if she was discovering that she was like changing or something. I don't know. No, I don't know. I still don't know what she is. I still don't really know what an oop here is. I guess they're, like I said, they're like vampire-like creatures, but I still don't understand what they are. We spent this whole season, and I still don't understand, which means I'm unhappy. Um, they end the season as if Peter is going to be gone, which we already know is not true. So, like, good luck just, like, having him suddenly come back for some reason. Like, that's going to be stupid. Like, I just, I don't know. I'm I'm still invested in the characters, and I think it's because the acting is well done. Mm -hmm. But I'm at the point where I know why it has poor ratings, and I don't have high hopes for the writing to get much better. Same, especially with the Rotten Tomatoes score only getting lower with every season. (laughs) So. Also... I know something about the next season, but I'm not going to talk about it until next week's episode because I feel like it's more of a we should discuss it then kind of thing. But Mm -hmm. it basically means that I'm going to have issues with the writing. Ah, I see. I just, it's going to be so much fun. I can't wait. I hope you guys have been enjoying or going through the same spiral that we've been going through every week. Yeah, Either I way- hope I hope that the one thing that the show is doing for you, which is what it's doing for me, is making me feel more confident in myself and my abilities. 
as a writer and as a critic of writing because at least I'm not this show. Yeah. Like, and it, and it sucks because the cast they actually have is a really amazing They have cast. such a good cast. They have such a good production team. Like, I mean, Eli Roth is the executive producer of the show. Like, yeah. it's Netflix is, it's in the first, like, five big Netflix shows that they did. It was, like, groundbreaking. They have mm-hmm. a great budget. And yet, it's just not good. Yeah. And I, and that could honestly fall in like how obscure the storyline is. And for, and like maybe in writing form in a book, it can read differently than putting it in a television show because you can add a lot of detail to your book. You can have people, they'll sit there and read like a thousand page books because people do it. But trying to scram like X amount of pages into like a 13 episode series is going to be a lot harder, so things are going to be sporadic, loose. There are going to be probably but loose that tie up. I think it's just, you know, no, I'm not going to say any more about what I think because it's about the whole season as a whole. So mm-hmm. I will save my thoughts for the next episode, but I do, I do have thoughts. So buckle up, folks. Buckle up. Next week will be a fun ride, and we have our first very first guest which is gonna be so much fun i can't wait um I'm did you watch she's gonna come in here looking all cute and like ready to go and like i'm gonna look like a troll and i'll be like oh yeah Hi. oh and also it. you don't know courtney in real life so you don't know but she is from louisiana and she has the cutest little twang i cannot wait i'm so excited yeah <laughs> that's my girl that's one of my bff Maybe if you want to be try to become a number one fan, maybe you'll be it. Maybe yeah, be maybe there. maybe interact with us, talk to us, uh, watch the podcast, and maybe you will get asked to join a, a season recap episode sometime in the future. Although I don't blame you if you would like to wait until we're watching a less shitty show. Yeah. Also, be ready. We have our Halloween episode coming out in two weeks now. We're very close to the end here, um, which makes me so happy. But that also reminds me that we're only getting closer to starting season two of this Godforsaken show. So, which I'm not looking forward to. But the faster we start season two, the faster season two will be over. Then we have to go to season three, and then we can start something fun. I mean, I'm having fun. I'm having fun. I just want to, when I, I want to have fun um, outside of recording it. I want to watch it and have fun as well and not be like, what am I watching? Yeah. I just also can't wait till we can watch things together and like have people like see our reactions to things in more real time. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. It's going to be a blast. When, when me and her are actually, like, when she's back home and we're able to film, like, together, it's going to be completely insane. But also, I apologize ahead of time, because if you think our banter is bad right now, and our episodes are too long for no reason, wait till we're in the same room. We'll go on a rant about Crab Rangoons, and it'll be a, one, one hell of a oh. time. Now I really want Crab Rangoon, but it's 10 p.m. on a Tuesday, and I gotta work in the morning. You know, I live a little. They also don't. There's, I've only found one restaurant that has even edible crab rangoon here. I, you know what? I think I'm going to order crab rangoons. I can do it. It's 11 o'clock. Lunch. Yeah. I was going to eat a bowl of cereal, but uh, when I got my groceries delivered, they were out of my yogurt. So I just had cereal and no yogurt, which is unfortunate. I eat cereal without yogurt. No, but I don't put cereal in milk. I put it in yogurt. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Let's let's we'll have our discussion about our cereal and yogurt and breakfast uh, options after this, so that they're not sitting here talking, listening to us talk about cereal and yogurt and crab rangoons. See what I mean? I'm sorry. But also, I highly suggest if you do like yogurt, put your cereal in yogurt because it doesn't get soggy. 
but then you also get the like milk flavor with your cereal. It's 10 out of 10. Unless it's like fruity cereal and you like the fruity milk at the bottom, then obviously drink milk. Like, especially like in Fruity Pebbles, I like when it's like crunchy but also soggy and like the milk like I hate soggy cereal. Wow. That's super soggy. But it's like it's like you pull a pour a big bowl of Fruity Pebbles, right? You put the milk on there. And it's like but you only put like so much milk, so like it's crunchy, but like you get enough milk on the spoon. It's so like when you slurp up the cereal, the milk comes through like the cracks in the fruity pebbles. And it like it's just like a perfect ratio of crunchy to like milk, and I love it. It all I'm gonna eat. I have I don't have milk though, right? It's disappointing when you realize you only have half of the food. Well, sorry that you guys had to hear me and Mary Kate talk about cereal for like five minutes. Uh, send us your uh, breakfast recommendations uh, on Instagram or Twitter at Death and Aliens. Uh, you can follow me at MKA Superstar uh, underscore E M K A or no E M K A Y underscore Superstar, and you can follow me on Instagram at Monica Lynn underscore, and then follow me on Twitter at Moni Lynn underscore or Moni underscore Lynn double underscore. And the reason why it's a double underscore is because my identity was stolen. So I'll say it every week until I get it back. You'll never get it back. You have to, like, apply to Twitter to get things like that back. Well, Twitter, you heard it here first. Give me. (laughs) Bye, guys. Bye.